along today. Uh, I know we, we've got a, a diverse group here today. Uh, I've got my slides up. You can follow the bit.ly link there at bit.ly forward slash SIBF15 hyphen BD for big data. Uh, you can also follow the QR code and that'll take you straight to SlideShare and you can just follow, follow along if you want um, uh, as we go today. So uh, first off, I'd like to thank our, um, all the folks who made this event possible, the folks with ALA and all the folks with the Sharjah uh, International Book Fair that we heard from this morning. They've done a remarkable job, excellent facilities, uh, excellent wireless and uh, all around wonderful uh, trip that I've had to get here to talk to you today. Uh, and like I said, uh, for those who are just joining, if you'd like to, to follow the slides along there online, I also tweeted them uh, recently at uh, SIBF15 if you want to grab that link and follow them as well. Um, just a little bit more about social media. Uh, please tweet us today uh, if you want to uh, while we're going along. Uh, we're talking about a range of subjects and I think it'll be fun to get it out there. Um, so the topics that I'm going to cover today is, is a little bit about foundations of uh, research data management and data management in libraries. A little bit more about, you know, why libraries should be involved in that uh, uh, entire workflow uh, cycle. And a little bit more about uh, libraries data uh, analysis, publication, and workflow. And I'm going to do this by uh, talking about several different use cases and several different scenarios uh, that I'm involved in, uh, both at Indiana University as well as with lots of collaborators, because almost all the projects that I work on right now dealing with uh, data sets, large data, and um, data analysis are with many, many, many different partners. So big data. Uh, the big piece uh, around big data is that, in, in truth, most of big data uh, that libraries are working with right now is an aggregate of lots of different smaller data sets. And in fact, a lot of the data that I've been working with in recent years is aggregation of uh, scientific data sets of smaller sizes that are basically being looked at in a meta-analysis kind of way, as well as uh, the work that I'm going to talk about, uh, a, a huge chunk of today's talk, is around the Hadi Trust Digital Library and the Hadi Trust Research Center and the meta-analysis that we're enabling there with the tool sets uh, that we've created for that. A little bit more on why libraries should be interested <clears throat> basically on data and analytics right now. When I look uh, you know, at my roadmap for technology uh, over the five-year period, because that's about all we can really plan for in technology is a five-year period, I always take a look at what's happening both in the academic realm of high performance computing and high throughput computing. Uh, I usually go to supercomputing conference at least once every two or three years to kind of see those technologies and how they're playing out at the bleeding edge. And then I look for where those might fall uh, into the library sphere and what we may need to be looking at next and supporting for our researchers, especially from an academic library point of view. And this is a survey, a uh, KPMG survey on technologies with greatest impact. And if you go read their report, it's got lots of different demographics. But the biggest piece here that, that was remarkable to me is in the greatest impact of technologies driving business transformation. And you'll see there, of course, the top one is cloud. Um, and that's, of course, the key word right now for anybody that's offering those kinds of services. Internet of Things is also up there pretty high. But the third one is data and analytics. And if you look at that from the US standpoint, it's gotten to a 13% um, kind of rate now. Well, uh, when it gets to 20, that means it's out of the tiny sector of technology where data and analytics is really what they do, and it starts becoming more of a phenomenon across all types of businesses because they see it as becoming more than just something you would be involved in if that was your business, and they see it as something that's a strategic investment that they need to have to understand how they're doing their business. And later on today, you'll actually hear uh, from one of our other speakers at this event about how hard data can enable decision-making processes for libraries, Patricia Wan. And a lot of what she's talking about is taking this whole content on this uh, KPMG survey and looking at how that takes, um, uh, you know, a, a can take a front row uh, piece for being strategic within libraries and decision-making. What I'm going to talk about today is how that's going to affect research in many different areas of our academic disciplines uh, over the next few years. Because a lot of what I'm talking about today, you know, was, was really bleeding edge just a few years ago in areas of genomics and other areas of, of what I call big science because they're the science that has the big publicity and the big money tied to usually what they're doing at the time. But what happens is as those technologies evolve over time, 
those start to um, uh, transform out into new areas because they become more cost effective and more like commodity IT that libraries can actually support, that other smaller colleges and schools can support, and they become uh, much more important for how the research workflow happens. So like I said, a lot of what we're working with uh, in terms of aggregated big data comes from many smaller packages, but one of the, the key use um, components that I'm gonna talk about today are where libraries are in terms of providing open data uh, repositories. We're starting to see in the US in our institutional repository programs, lots more data as a published object. And if we look at libraries as publishers, we see a trend right now where many more academic libraries are getting involved in this, whether it's from publishing white papers with assigned DOIs and institutional pro uh, repository programs, to whether it's publishing software, whether it's publishing data uh, for citation within larger papers. And, and this is more important in, in different sub-disciplines than it is in aggregate across the whole, but it's something that we all should be paying attention to because when you start requiring that, and we, we've seen that in government mandates in recent years in the United States uh, from our uh, National Science Foundation, from the National Institutes of Health, uh, and from other areas that they want to see good data management programs for researchers and PIs who get uh, research grants from them so that that data is available for the long term. And a lot of what that's about is the transparency of the research process and opening up that transparent process so that the research uh, can be replicated over time. And it gets more and more complicated when everything that you're doing is one giant uh, piece of software code that runs in a high performance computing area or even in a small performance computing area because that means if someone wants to replicate it, they're gonna need access to the software, the data, and possibly even a virtualized uh, machine component of the actual computer that ran the code the first time. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, but I'm also gonna talk a lot about workflow. And research is, is um, mostly now about workflow in, in many different areas, and that workflow is often about data. So that's, that's another key point I want to take away from today. And I've got this great um, workflow example piece, and what this is mapping is kind of the scholarly communication um, landscape of workflows, and it's going in, in uh, different directions. So at the very top is the traditional piece. You know, you've got your uh, uh, data coming from a commercial vendor, you're analyze, analyzing it with SPSS in a commercial workflow. You're writing about it in something like uh, Windows. Uh, then you're publishing it in something like Nature. Then you've got an outreach component, an assessment component of your research that all folds back into like your next, you know, what is your next research project, right? Well, then we've got a modern take on it, and an innovative take, an experimental take, a Google take if you just used everything that Google had to do your, your research workflow. And I, I kind of like that um, piece. But then there's also one down here at the bottom that I would call it somewhere between innovative and experimental is, is what's happening with groups like Macmillan who are starting to set up a component of that workflow that, uh, guess what, is a service that libraries can actually pay for for their researchers. But the key piece is, is looking at your own landscape and looking at what you may want to pay for as a service for your researcher and what you may be able to provide from your own institutional resources. And that's something that uh, you know, I, I really think about a lot. We have some really wonderful research cyber infrastructure at Indiana University, but no matter what we do with that, the communications are not enough. We need to do more outreach, more connection with our researchers. We need to do more direct training, both from the IT side of things, as well as from the library side of things, and in fact, we need to look at how we use our spaces in libraries because libraries typically have the best spaces. You know, I've, I've been an IT guy for a long time and, and my office is usually in some far off place way away <laughs> from most of the researchers. But in libraries, we're starting to see this trend in our facilities where we have these wonderful collaborative spaces and we need to be able to take advantage of them uh, and offer the right types of training that will connect up researchers with this workflow. And that's the important part that I'm talking about today because everything I'm looking at today is a use case of that kind of workflow and where it fits within the research experience and where the library overlaps with that. Now there's a lot of IT overlap, there's a lot of uh, uh, computing overlap with this, there's a lot of what I would call a traditional uh, vice president for research at a university kind of overlap with this. But for today I want us to focus on where the, where the library's at and where we can really engage on this because that's gonna become critical for the academic library of the future. So my key point 
I don't want you to, 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 to miss this, is where is your researcher workflow? Looking at the demographics of your researchers that are at your institution, what is their user experience? How many people here could answer that for like, say, you know, if, if you're college or university, the biggest graduates are MBAs, you know, that's the most that go through on a regular basis. How many could tell me what that workflow is for a typical MBA and how, it, how they go about their business? I, I couldn't because I don't work with that many MBAs, but the ones I've worked with lately at Indiana University are doing lots of data mining themselves. And they're generally doing it across uh, uh, basically third-party data that's commercial data, whether it's old newspapers from ProQuest, whether it's um, uh, journal articles about different types of business topics that they want to look at in mass and really come up with new ways of, of slicing and dicing the data. That's one key piece. So thinking about that, you know, where does that fit in the ecosystem of the library? And this is uh, my library, Herman B. Wells Library in Bloomington, Indiana. Um, we support uh, nine different libraries across the system at IU that's all over, over the state of Indiana and in the United States. And um, so that's usually the question I keep coming back to when I'm looking at how I'm supporting my researchers. We're looking at things like collaboration spaces, and I've talked about this with uh, regards to the spaces in libraries. We've just built a new Scholars Commons area, and the whole point of the Scholars Commons area at Herman B. Wells Library that you just saw is to look at how we can do outreach for the researcher and the graduate student. How can we improve that research workflow? How can we offer training that can help them with their overall research experience? We're also starting now to set up maker spaces in that same area uh, to do similar kinds of things, because what this allows for is basically fast failure. You prototype these things and you do it cheaply so you can learn from your mistakes and make it better and better in the whole engineering process of what you're doing with your workflow. If we look at libraries as publishers, I mentioned this before, and I love this, feel free to take photographs for personal use, but please ask for permission regarding publication in any medium. <laughs> That's another big piece. A lot of what we want to see with this published data is that it's available for reuse because without the reuse possibility and the licensing, you know, it's not going to be possible to have that transparent research process and to be able to replicate it over time. I uh, wanted to bring up a particular survey, the Once and uh, Future Publishing Library, which was a Council on Library and Information Resources publication by Okerson and Holtzman, and they basically did a big survey. Now, most all of these libraries were from North America. Most of them were research libraries, although they broke it down by uh, large research libraries and uh, four-year liberal arts colleges. And um, basically, that, this is the demographic of the library. 78% were uh, large research, 22% were liberal arts four year. But guess what? When they asked them, do you engage in library publishing now or plan to do so soon? 98% said yes, 2% um, said uh, maybe, and then in terms of no, that was zero. So everybody was uh, either publishing um, some kind of object, whether it's a paper, data, uh, something else, or planning to do it in, in their entire survey. And it was, it was a pretty large survey. So thinking about that and thinking about libraries that are repositories, basically we're just talking about a different medium, a medium that lends itself toward a digital workflow much better than in the past. Because I always find it interesting, I, I did at one point lots of research with lots of actual books and lots of actual music scores when yeah, you always saw you coming from the library with three or four bags weighted down 50 pounds each uh, because that's what you had to do to do your research. Um, now I see these digital workflows in almost every discipline. They're, they're not prominent in every discipline, but they're there enough that it's important for us to take a look at how we fit into that workflow. So I love this quote, and this is a friend of mine, Daniel Katz. Uh, he's at the University of Chicago, and uh, we work on a, um, right now a committee for a, a group called Force 11. And Force 11 is a group you should hear about in terms of new types of scholarly communication. They have an annual conference this year's is in Portland, and it's called Force 2016. But Daniel, this is a tweet, uh, so I didn't actually cite it to an actual journal article or anything, but he's tweeted this several times in several different ways. But he says, Nobel Prizes have been given for inventing instruments. And he's eagerly awaiting for one for inventing software. And that really is the next stage, I think, of this workflow in the scholarly communication process for a lot of our disciplines. And I wanted to bring this up because what I've worked with, with Daniel on a few times 
is sustainability for research software. And, and I've worked in one of his workshops <coughs> last year where we brought lots of diverse disciplines together talking about how important it is for them to be able to get access to the software that's been developed to do certain things and to preserve it over time and to make it available for when we want to do um, uh, different types of replications of uh, long-term experiments. So one thing that we're doing now at Indiana University is actually publishing uh, computational virtual machines. And if you think about a virtual machine, uh, if, you, if, uh, if you think about it this way, uh, uh, Amazon offers these online. You can go sign up for one, $10 a month, and you can open um, a little window on any device you have and have a Windows desktop, and it's ready to go, right? That's what a virtual machine is, and what we're doing is working with a, a cloud-based National Science Foundation project called Jetstream so that every experiment they do, as they create the virtual machine and the data that comes from it, we're taking that copy of that virtual machine and we're publishing it just like a journal article and putting it out there with the document object identifier so that when they want to go run these experiments again, they can go pull that by the DOI, pull it in, open it up, start the machine, then they can start pulling data in through DOIs and pulling in large quantities. And guess what? Right now, that's, that's pretty novel. It's interesting. It's something we're trying out. We don't, we don't have a perfect solution for it, but we're, we're trying to do it. Now, five years from now, the next NSF project in cloud computing, Jetstream 2, Jetstream 3, Jetstream 4, whatever that's called, it will want to do meta-analysis across all these virtual machines. So instead of just pulling one virtual machine and new associated, uh, associated data to rerun through it, they will pull 50, 100, 150, 200 virtual machines. And first they'll do an analysis across all of them and see what worked and what didn't work in those experiments. Then they'll probably narrow that down to the top five. And then that's where they'll start their entry point on the next generation of research for this. So that's why it's so important for libraries to get involved at early stages of this so that we can better understand that workflow for our researchers. So, I love this uh, quote. It's from a talk given recently by Lorcan Dempsey uh, for an OCLC research uh, seminar they had in Chicago. And he says, libraries serve the research and learning needs of their universities. And in my mind, to do that now, I have to figure out where I am in that digital workflow for my researcher and how I can provide the best user experience for that researcher. And a lot of that is gonna be um, about integrating silos, offering workflows, and figuring out where that whole length of, uh, uh, you know, basically research workflows that we saw up there fit into my environment, what's best for my researcher. Some of it could be purchased, some of it could be open sourced, but all of it needs to uh, weave together in a new kind of way for the researcher. So, one of my central uh, uh, pieces today is going to be about the Hathi Trust Research Center. And how many folks in the audience know about the Hathi Trust Digital Library? There's a few folks, so that's good. So the Hathi Trust Digital Library came out of the Google Books program and that, that the big question was asked uh, of the uh, founders of Google, what if the prototypical research library, and in this case, the University of Michigan, one of them graduated from there, um, could be put online completely, right? So then over time, we worked with lots and lots and lots of different libraries and, uh, uh, to, to build out that aggregate research library. So now we're at 14, right at 14 million volumes that are in the Hathi Trust. And along the way, one of the other big questions that was asked was, well, once we get that kind of content online, how are we going to mine it in new ways or set up new workflows in new ways to enable different kinds of research across this corpus? And so I was lucky enough to be involved with a group that uh, put together a proposal to form the Hathi Trust Research Center. And the research center is supported by Indiana University, the University of Illinois at Urban Urbana-Champaign, and the University of Michigan, which is the home of uh, the Hathi Trust Digital Library. So we put that together to see how we could build workflows for creating new knowledge. I mean, that's, that's at the heart of what we're doing. So one of our biggest pieces that we had to overcome first was this, what we call the non-consumptive research paradigm, which I know is a really uh, a mouthful, but it came out of the legal documents surrounding the Google Books uh, settlement uh, in the end. But the whole point is, that we want to allow the creation of new knowledge, which is fair use under copyright, um, without letting someone take uh, parts of the copyrighted book away or uh, transform it into new kinds of uh, 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 
content uh, without permission of, uh, of the folks who own the copyright. And so that's the whole point of what we tried to enable. So in, in order to do that, we created several different types of tools to set that up. And this just gives you a, a good idea of the breakdown of the actual digital library. Uh, we're close to 14 million volumes now. 50% of the volumes are in English. Um, we got material from the 15th century on to the 20th century. 70% is in copyright or undetermined. And if it's undetermined because of the license we use it under, we have to treat it almost like it's in copyright as well. And 30% is open. Now, for the past two, two years or so, the Hadi Trust Research Center has been uh, basically setting up our tools on the 30% that's open, which is about four and a half million volumes. So it gives us enough to, to work with the tools, to work with the workflows and the researchers and see what we can find. Over the next coming months, we're gonna be uh, able to analyze the entire uh, corpus but we have to play under that copyright uh, guideline there uh, in order to stay uh, in sync with the license that we use the material under. So if we look at that ecosystem, and I, I call it an ecosystem here, but it really is this workflow and where it fits in terms of the research workflow. Um, from the Hadi Trust standpoint, you've got the collection, the preservation going on in the Hadi Trust Digital Library, and the access. But the access there is just one-to-one. -one. It's one book to one person kind of access. Um, whereas if we take a look at what we're trying to do with the Hadi Trust Research Center, we want to allow uh, one, what, what I call uh, uh, wide-scale reading, where I want to I read one million volumes at a time and not have to go one-to-one -to, -one to pick those out. So if you look at it this way, you're looking at an ecosystem that works with the researcher to gather that subset of the 14 million uh, analyze it for what's there, probably reanalyze it a few times, and re um, uh, uh, kind of cut it up uh, in smaller packages. And then you come out with a new knowledge map, and that's your in game production there um, for what we're doing with the research center. So we do, we've come up with a few approaches, uh, approaches to allow this. We have a secure portal, and this secure portal is getting a lot of uh, interest of late uh, from library archives, especially archives that have lots of born digital archival material, because they have the same issues. They're not co ones of copyright, they're ones of timeliness, because if you have the archives of, of say, some famous uh, politician or ambassador who's still alive, well then, the latest stuff Everyone's still alive who was part of the scenario. So you want to have access for researchers who need access to it, but you can't just put it on the public web because folks are still alive. Now, 50, 60, 100 years from now, they won't be. It can go online. Everyone can see what's there, right? Um, so that's another area that's come up for us. Uh, the data capsule allows us to do that, and we've created uh, uh, several different tools uh, and used several different open source pieces of software to work on our extraction services for this. So this gives you an idea of how the data capsule work, works. Once again, you'll see that there's a virtual machine, uh, and that's how we um, basically allow the interaction between the researcher and the data. We provide the computation for them to analyze the data, and then when they're done, we give them a new knowledge map to the data that can take lots of different variants, but the key part is it can't um, violate that non-consumptive research paradigm that we've set out to enforce uh, along the way of research. So this just gives you an idea of what can happen. You've got two different machines here, and you'll see that they look a lot like Linux, if you know Linux. Um, uh, and it, they, one gives you access to the data, one takes you into secure mode, where it cuts off all access to the rest of the internet. You have access to our data, you can run your algorithms against it, you can build your new knowledge map, and that's what happens in the secure mode. And then this third one shows you what happens once someone has uh, sets of code and they can build a new interface. And in fact, this is an interface that was um, basically existed before, but they uh, have developed it over time to work with uh, the tools of HTRC so that you can see a topic map by volume. Now, can you imagine uh, right now, you can go search your library's catalog for some keywords, and it tells you where that appears in the metadata. What if each one of these lines represented a single volume in your library, and you did the same keyword search, and it could tell you everywhere that keyword appeared in the actual volume and page itself? That's what's happening here. But right now, the computational effort to do that is quite a lot. It's not something you could just run and pay for from every library. But guess what? In five to 10 years, that will be affordable, 
And you will be able to do that in new ways with all, all different types of libraries. And so that's one of the key things we're after here is looking at that possibility for what's next in the workflow. So the grand motivation is to slice through a massive corpus from HathiTrust and, a label, and, and basically enable the creation of new knowledge. And that's what's going to be game changing, uh, in our view, for all different types of scholars. Because everything we're coming up with can be used in new ways. And in fact, one of the most novel ways that's being used right now is in areas of uh, research economics from a professor at the University of Toronto. I can't say much about her um, research yet because she hasn't published it, but she's finding some really interesting uh, uh, items across the entire 14 million collection. It just, you know, it didn't exist before for her to be able to do this. And she spent years working with OCLC and a few other places that have access to lots of metadata, but not to actual page uh, data uh, by word. So this gives you a, a little bit better high-level picture of this workflow that we built for the Hathi Trust Research Center. We've got the Hathi Trust corpus. Basically, you're looking at everything that's there, the, um, uh, both the metadata, the actual text, and we're just focused on text right now. We think over the next few years that images will be a big, bigger deal for us. And in fact, we've already had interest uh, from some of the music retrieval folks in computer science who want to try to find every um, instance of music that's in an image within the 14 million. We haven't had uh, the right research grant written yet because I think it'll take that with the compute power that, that it will need in order to do some of that work for them. But we are doing it with the text because, uh, because it's manageable right now. This builds a work set, which is kind of a new kind of term that we've created, and that's that first subset of the collection that you want to dig deeper into. And then basically over time, you end up with these serialized data sets, and a lot of those are available. We've made one extracted feature data set available, and then it's, it's been turned into two or three more by digital human, uh, humanists who have said, oh, this is great. Now I'm going to go subset it for everything in the early English books collection, because guess what? You know, that's easy to use right now. It's not in copyright. Um, and then they turned it into other forms of data sets that have been used to create different types of new, what I would call, uh, interfaces for the material. And this gives you just another view of that same kind of uh, workflow uh, that I've been talking about. But key to this is an understanding a concept that's been around now for about four or five years, and it's called distant reading. And I put the book up there by uh, Franco Moretti. He's at the Stanford Literary Lab. Uh, if you follow that bit.ly link, it'll take you straight to WorldCat so you can see the citation. Um, but basically, he wants to understand literature not by studying particular text, but by aggregating and analyzing massive amounts of data. And that's exactly what I've just described to you in the workflows that we've enabled with the Hathi Trust Research Center. So how does that fit? The other big piece here is what types of data interfaces are your researchers interested in? I've shown you one already that starts to look at by volume or text to peers. I think there are lots more and it's going to be the, uh, basically to the imagination of the researcher where we find these and figure out how important they are for the researcher. This is the one, this is probably a better shot of it. It gives you an idea of what it looks like. We're working on this now in, in another research project to see if we could build what I, what I would call a visual catalog, where every book could be shown by the various word counts in each book. And uh, that's how you would actually go through and browse rather than by um, uh, doing the same thing with the metadata about the book. Um, this is done by um, Colin Allen's lab at Indiana University and his uh, PhD student, Jamie Murdoch. They've worked with us a lot to, to get this running in our own infrastructure. And so it's something you can use now. Uh, we did a... Um, a seminar on this this summer where we had about 25 people come in new to the tool set, trained them on the tool set, trained them how to use this new explorer, and then they were able to subset their own content and build their own catalogs of the content uh, for long-term use. Another, Chris Forrester at Syracuse University. We have yet to work with Chris Forrester, but he took our first serialized uh, extracted feature set and built his own interface. And basically, this is looking at over all the decades of uh, that uh, extracted feature set, the length of the books that appear in the decades and how it gets longer or shorter depending on the decade that it was published in, right? Novel idea we hadn't thought of before, but it came along because we were able to take this new knowledge map and make it open, and then we had researchers taking it and doing new things with it. This is another one from Jonathan Goodwin uh, at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Basically, he's taking the same kind of um, 
analysis that we saw in that first visualization, and he started uh, putting that out by uh, topic area so he could browse books by topic rather than by author, keyword, or title. And uh, he's doing this on a particular uh, set of early English books uh, so that basically he can get his students involved, his graduate students, and show them uh, different ways of going about finding uh, content that either they didn't know existed that way or didn't know included those topics in them before. So what types of data are needed? That's kind of my third key point here. Um, one of the things I've talked about is libraries as repository. Uh, we're starting to see that with software. This is another group that I work with uh, through Force 11, and it's, uh, uh, they have their own Journal of Open Research Software. It's uh, published by Ubiquity Press, which is an open access publisher. The key thing here is software. And what, what I have up here is another piece of software that's been developed by my research center called Comadu. When they finished it, they wanted people to know the software existed and, and reuse it for their topic area, so they published it here with the Journal of Open Research Software, uh, and that's the key thing. We're seeing lots of repositories looking at this feature, and in fact, if you know the CERN repository software in Vino, they have a cloud version of it called Zenodo, and I'm just going to keep throwing out words, and you're like, when is this guy ever going to stop with these words, right? Um, but the key piece that Zenodo offers in their cloud base it's a direct tie to the software repository called GitHub, so that you can publish direct into Zenodo using GitHub, which is a tool that uh, software developers use all the time. Um, and uh, it's, it's not important uh, that you know that much about that, that workflow. It's important that you know that that could be another key way of capturing that research output that's so important uh, to your researchers as well as to your universities. Another key piece that I've worked with is an NSF project called Seed. Uh, Seed actually offers an end-to-end -end repository for data. It gives you an interactive uh, working environment to collect your data, to annotate your data, to, and then eventually to publish your data, uh, both through uh, institutional repositories. We're working with the University of Illinois repository, Indiana University's repository, as well as some of the uh, NSF-specific disciplinary repositories so that you can publish that data once you're done with it and give it a, assign it a DOI and then you're able to cite it in your, in your paper that you write about the data collection process and the experiment. So those are two other good examples to keep in mind as you look at this. So if we think about this, libraries and the researcher. What are the workflows needed by your researcher? What are the interfaces that support those workflows? And what is the data that supports those workflows, interfaces, and researchers? And how does this um, exist both at the local, the regional, and what I would say, uh, you've got a national and then an international level. And key things to keep in mind on all of this now are the groups that are starting to emerge around this. Another key area that we work with at IU is the Research Data Alliance, which is a group that's really broad in scale, very global, uh, has interest from, from most um, existing countries out there that uh, are tied into to large-scale science. And one of the key areas that they have is a group for libraries, a group for data centers. There's a lot of synergies across those, but, but key to this is participation by libraries. And every time I go to the libraries group, it's usually one of the smaller groups there, but the folks who are there are already dealing with these issues, whether it's around data repository and publishing, or software um, uh, repositories and publishing, or we're, they're, they're more involved in this workflow component that ties back into where the data centers are at, where the research is at, where the researcher is at. So these are all things to keep in mind for that. So li libraries are repositories of data for the creation of new knowledge. I think that a lot of what I've talked about today um, kind of harps on that uh, conclusion. But in thinking about that, we need to think as librarians about what the new library services uh, are gonna be that we provide to support those workflows and the creation of new knowledges. So that's, um, that's key for today, I think. And what's next? So I told you what I do to kind of look at what's coming ahead and how that is. Now, there's all examples right now out there of everything I talked about today with a library participating in some way, but it's at the bleeding edge, right? It's not ubiquitous across libraries yet or across research libraries yet. Um, I've got this up there because I love the Hyperloop. That's a great, a great uh, idea of a design where they said, well, we can't work on it right now, so we're going to open this up um, and make it available to others to work on it since we don't have the time. Another area that just emerged in the last week or so is one about machine learning. Google, if you'll go look this up, you'll find all the press releases about it. 
uh, talked about open sourcing their uh, uh, Tense Workflows. Their Tense Workflows is a project that basically allows you to do machine learning, and machine learning is a, a concept that would allow you to do things like talk to your phone, and uh, it would translate the text straight to the phone and then do the search for you. Well, now that this is open source, uh, the big question for me is, over the next five years, how could something like that fit into the workflow of something like the Hadi Trust Research Center? Right now, there's a good bit of effort that, that it takes on the researcher's end to go create that uh, subset of uh, volumes and then to run their algorithm against it. What if I could allow um, a machine learning piece to happen where I could just say, okay, here's the works, I w works that I want to go after because there's a published DOI for it. Here's the algorithm I want to run against it because I know it exists because it was published and cited by one of those researchers that I just showed you their interfaces for. And then I want, to, I want to tweak the algorithm just a little bit and run it against the whole thing and see what that knowledge map looks like. That's what would uh, happen if we had something that was widely available like that machine learning tool that we could apply. And over the next five or six years, I'm sure we're going to be taking a look at that and how that could affect what, what could be there in terms of the workflow for the researcher. And that's, um, I, I think, what I had to say today about uh, academic uh, libraries and big data. And I'm glad to take any questions or any clarifications, because I know there was a lot of data there <laughs> that we went through pretty quickly. Uh, and I know we are also uh, uh, trying to translate a bit, and that can be tough with some of these technical areas. Thank you. I see Molly back there <laughs> has a question. <laughs> That's an excellent question, and in fact, uh, I was at the Educause conference about two weeks ago now, and we talked a lot about where we were with Hadi Trust Research Center and what we were doing. And one of the key concepts that came up was how do you do this with third-party data? And I kind of mentioned it when I talked about you know the typical MBA, and we're seeing more of the data mining there, right? So uh, a lot of this vended data, you know, the vendors are coming back and saying, "Well, it's your data. Okay, uh, we'll give you the tape of it." Uh, and then they give you this big uh, license with it. And guess what? That license is much more restrictive than the ones I talked about today. But the key thing is, is a lot of these tools that I talked about could be used for that if we found better ways of enforcing uh, basically uh, data security compliance. And I didn't go into the technical side of my talk for Hadi Trust Research Center. We have about 18 levels of data security compliance to meet the criteria that we have. Um, I think you would probably have more with one of those standard licenses because they don't think about using it that way. But the good part is, is we're seeing vendors that are really, they understand the research need. They understand they're going to have to do it, but it's expensive and they're not quite ready to do that yet. I think at some point um, you'll be able to take the tools that we have and run them in, say, let's say an Amazon or Microsoft cloud environment, and then you could do that, but it is going to take some expertise um, from the end of the library and the IT side and the research side, but it also will take some understanding from the researchers because, you know, the first time I got involved in one of these MBA groups doing data mining, they were the very end of their PhD process. And then they, and, and then they were like, oh, that's all owned by ProQuest, not the library. Oh, I want to do, you know, this analysis that I hadn't quite figured out yet. So we found a way for the person to do it, but it, it, was, a, it was an expensive one-off. And... Um, that's the kind of thing we're hoping to mitigate by having some of these tools, because all the tools for Hadi Trust Research Center are completely open. We want to find new uses for them outside of just Hadi Trust Digital Library, but that's going to take a lot more interest and, and I think a little more investment from libraries in being interested in doing that and seeing where that fits in the workflow. Because it might not. At cer certain institutions, it might be more on the shoulders of research computing, but 
when I talk to groups in research computing doing this, they're like, well, how could the library help us with this? Because we're not used to having to, you know, uh, have the data beforehand. We're used to collecting it from the experiment and then analyzing it, and we don't know how to work with ProQuest or EBSCO or somebody like that who has the data that, that the researcher wants to analyze. So I'm hoping we'll make some headway there, but e-monographs are tough right now. And they're tough for a lot of different ways uh, that I won't go into today, but one of them would be this, this analysis route. Yeah, question over here. Hi. Sure, my name is Mohammed Masaran. I'm from Victoria uh, Pacific. Uh, thank you very much for the nice presentation. Um, you are the highest I have noticed, and uh, or noticed that you are concentrating more and more for the future of the electronic and literature. My question, the same question I was asking the last year, and I would like to take your opinion about that. What's the future book, physical book on the shelf? Do you think that as new generations like this, they will go and say, like they are going to the electrical and the digital? So, do you think that the physical book in the near future that they will ignore it or will continue? Thank you very much. That's also a great, great question. Thank you very much. Um, I think my opinion on that is that we need the book medium right now because that's how we get past a lot of these intellectual property issues. Because if we didn't still own all those physical volumes that were in the Hathi Trust Digital Library, it'd be very difficult for us to do what we're doing under US copyright law. Now that being said, I think it's gonna, you know, something's gonna have to give here, because we've gone too far in protecting certain rights driven by certain groups, uh, whereas, you know, in, in, in the beginning, our copyright was set up to basically allow the, you know, the best use of, uh, uh, of older data for the creation of new knowledge. So right now, the book is a friendly medium that we still greatly need, um, but in terms of the future, it's one that we need to um, show how workflows can basically um, uh, be driven that will uh, uh, enable us to do more with the digital version. Um, any other questions? Well, thank you so much. You've been a great audience, and I've really enjoyed talking to you today.